Ladies and gentlemen, it's now my great pleasure to welcome and introduce His Excellency Armen Sarkisian, the President of Armenia. Dr. Sarkisian has served as President of Armenia since April 2018. He is not only a politician, but he is also a physicist and computer scientist. And he is, ladies and gentlemen, a true champion of global dialogue and engagement. He has been moving Armenia to the forefront of globalization. Armenia's economy is booming, especially in the area of digitalization and ICT. And Armenia is a very active member of the global community. President Sarkisian will speak about how to vitalize global governance. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Richter. It's a pleasure to speak to you. And it's my, my great pleasure and honor to speak to a wider audience in a friendly and friendly country like India. Well, I could have said that friendly, friendly, because the friendly goes up to centuries and thousands of years of relations between Armenia and Armenians and India. And there are so many, so many examples of that. Armenians used to travel to India and Indians to Armenia going back to 2,000 years ago and more. We are even words and names related to, to Sanskrit and India and Indian history. And we have Armenian communities very active for hundreds of years in Calcutta, in Madras, in, in Mumbai and many other places. So we are two, <laughs> two friends, one small in the size of the population. The other one is big, but uh, culturally we, we, we are very brotherly nations. So it's my great pleasure to speak to the audience in India. The thing that you asked me to talk is about current situation and where we are and what is happening and where are the difficulties. The amazing, it's an amazing point today, Mr. Richter, because from one point of view, the world is, is facing a huge crisis. It's a humanitarian crisis. It's a human crisis. We are losing hundreds of thousands of lives are, are lost in many countries, including in my own uh, country, Armenia. We have more than 400 people who are dead. For a small country, it's a huge number, and there are more than 20,000 already discovered who are, who are affected, and we are still climbing. So it's a big tragedy for, for the world. So it looks like we could have said that this is the worst moment. But if I take myself out of my duties as the president, my, my life as a, as a citizen of the Republic of Armenia, and go somewhere into the cosmos. You said I'm a physicist. I used to be an astrophysicist, so I would like to look at this planet from the, from, with the eyes of an uh, alien. Then what I would see is that we are living in a world that it has accumulated both the best and the worst. So the worst because we are facing a huge uh, a huge health crisis and the coronavirus as, as a pandemic, which is taking lives, destroying economies, relations, uh, logistics, trade, many things. So we are going to face further and further uh, deepening of the economic crisis. So that's very, very bad. But if I look to the, uh, at, at the world, uh, just days or months before the coronavirus started, and maybe if I will have uh, an ability to look after, then I would say that probably from the point of view of humanity, we are living the most exciting time. Because for the first time, we have a world which is so much interconnected. Connectivity, connections are phenomenal. So we speak to each other, one from Australia, the other one from Argentina, you, Switzerland, and our colleagues in India. This is a fantastically connected, over-connected uh, planet. On the other side, we are traveling so freely. So for, for anybody traveling from India to Armenia, from Armenia to Argentina to Australia, it, it's just a daily routine for us. So we have become absolutely interconnected world. Then we have to learn how to expand the potential of this, of, of this planet in producing, for example, basic products like food. We can produce huge amounts of food. And if you go back 50 years ago, the big, the big uh, uh, they say, fear of the world was hungry China or hungry India. 
because there was uh, there was nobody was sure 60 70 years ago that those countries with billion of population can manage feed their people of course this is a world where there are hundreds of millions of uh, still very poor and 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 starving people that we have not solved but we have shown that this planet with a new technology is able to to solve this problem we are uh, living in a planet when uh, that we have discovered we have discovered the nature deep inside, I mean, going up to elementary particles up to the space. And we are living uh, exciting times, or I call it our evolution, rapid evolution. It's not even an industrial uh, revolution, because industrial revolution is, an, is a revolution that is connected to one, one issue, like the first ones related, the first I think was the industrial revolution, where people discovered how to use the power of fire. And then the how to use the power of the of the vapor, water vapor that comes from the fire, and create uh, 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 machines and and and, uh, and locomotives. And then it comes to to discovery of electricity. Then the world has changed, and discovery of computers. But now we are living a time where revolutions happen and will happen every day. So that means that we will be changing this world to the better. To the, I hope to the better uh, every day. So this is from one point of view, today is, is a very tragic moment, but from historic perspective, this is a wonderful time when the future is clear to me that it's not going to be the classical world as we know knew before because of our, of our rapid development, because of the huge capacity and the power that, the, that humanity has. And the world is going to change. I think the, 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 the way we produce cars is going to change because it will be done by robotic lines, by artificial intelligence. People will not lose jobs because like that when the computers were introduced, people didn't lose jobs, but a country like India has, has got a new place in the, in the new world where the jobs are distributed. Uh, India is a place where computer services are number one in the world. They service Switzerland, they service Britain, the service America. So India has discovered new jobs, which are international jobs, which didn't exist. So fear, fearing of introduction of computers that will destroy jobs, in reality, they created millions and millions of new jobs. The same will happen with artificial intelligence. So we are living in a completely different world, and there'll be a lot of challenges, because many of our values we have to revalue. Because the way we were running many things, Many aspects of our lives are becoming, I call it quantum, starting from, from global risks, like the pandemic is a global risk, why we are facing this huge tragedy, not because coronavirus is a very unique virus, no. Coronavirus is a virus that we have seen before as well, but is different is the world. The world has changed. It's not the same classical world. It's interconnected, so that's why the virus spreads all over the world very fast. And it's not sort of a going classically from starting from China, going to Mongolia, Kazakhstan, Russia, then Europe. No, it jumps from there to Europe, then to Latin America, wherever. So this is a completely new world. In order to fix the global risk, we have to, first of all, change our habits and the way we look at the world. In order to make this world better, we have to start learning that the introduction of things like like the new achievements of biotechnology into the healthcare, or new achievements of artificial intelligence into production, that will change the whole, whole environment, the whole economy. It will change also the industry. We have to redefine what, are, what will be the priorities for us for the next 100 years. Because as I told you, I think production of cars will not be located where you have cheap workforce, or production of shirts will not be located on the places where they have cheap workforce. It will be located in the places where you have the most intelligence because it will be run by robots. But it will create new millions of millions of jobs of those who are running the artificial intelligence. So this is a new exciting world. In the middle, we have the trouble. So from historic perspective, I would say this is a turning point. This is a crossroad. And we have to redefine many things, up to how we, how we are, how we are sort of exercising basic human values, basic political values, and we have to redefine it, including 
values like democracy. Let's go back. All of these years, the, the moment from its birth and becoming international sort of a, a necessity, democratic institution, democratic behavior, democratic way of uh, running your, your life, in huge territories like Europe and the West, and in the East and in the South, democracy has become a very important part of our life. But the way we exercise a democracy today and tomorrow will be different. I think just simple uh, election when you go to the polling station and just basically you vote for, for the next MP, and then he is responsible for you and he comes and tells about his achievements or failures, let's say, uh, once or twice a year, and then in five years, he, we are, you have to re-elect her or him, it is going to be different because the politicians are responsible of whatever they do today daily because there is Facebook and the voters vote daily. So there is a huge and will be a huge change of our, the way we behave. Look at the world. I think just institutions which are based on ideology, be that left or right, institutions that are classical institutions. They are now led by, by uh, uh, other forces, in many cases, uh, charismatic leaders that have direct access to the people. They are bypassing the usual newspapers. They are bypassing the usual television stations. They are by by bypassing even their own political parties and having direct connection and discussion with the people. Because, and uh, you, I don't want to bring example, it's a worldwide from, from America up to Asia. What is happening now? And you call them, some of them come uh, in a form, political changes come in a form of populism or political changes or revolutions. But if you look at the core of it, the core of it is the change of the world, that we're living in a completely world. And let's be honest, even in India, in Armenia, anywhere in America, in China, Russia, I mean, you go to, to China, you go to India, everybody's working with, with his virtual uh, me. Basically, it's his, that telephone that can, can, contains the connection with the world, with, with the speed of light, that contains the huge amount of information about the world and about the individual, is also a part of the life. And we spend a part of big, of, uh, big part of our time in the uh, in virtual world. So the world, my message is, yes, this is a dramatic moment. This coronavirus has created a huge, huge sort of a, with a huge voice, the coronavirus is saying, wake up, the world has changed. We have to rethink about many things, how we run our healthcare, how we run our institutions, how we are organized. Instead of waiting until the pandemic happens and we throw into the markets the trillions of dollars or euros or anything else, why don't we think wisely and spend that money beforehand, before the virus, coronaviruses on healthcare, on nature, preservation of nature, which is very important because a lot of us do understand that future pandemics will be a result of the unhealthy relations between humans and the nature which includes animals and, and, and contaminated nature will create new pandemics, contaminated relations with animals and other people. So it's a time that we're on the crossroad. It's, this is a wonderful world with tragic moments, but I think the, the world has not been so much connected, so much rich, so much uh, achieved, if you take historically than today. I think the only thing that is missing is it's common sense <laughs> that we all to have to use that, recognize that the world has changed. And in order to make it more sharper, I am using uh, as a physicist a term which is called the new quantum world. So whatever we had before was the classic. Demography is changing rapidly. Everything is changing. So it's, it is a new quantum world. For many, it's unpredictable, it's unknown, it's challenging, it's frightening. But for those who will start embracing this world using new logic and new philosophy, it will be the best place in the universe to live. That's my introduction. If you have any further questions, happy to hear from you. 
Thanks so much. I fully agree that the world is a wonderful place we are living in. And I think we have to embrace the future, we have to shape the future. And there's definitely light at the end of the tunnel. Um, now, if you look ahead and with all this optimism, uh, what can we do in this um, world which is interconnected? What kind of new institutions do we need? How do we have to steer this world to come out of this crisis? Well, uh, I would not go the path of going through new institutions. I think we have a, a lot of institutions that we already have been developing for years. And we take United Nations and other international organizations and so on. What, uh, what we have to, to do is that we have to think, rethink their role. How they have to act the next 10 years or 20 years, what sort of powers we have to give them into this new quantum world. Their powers, their, their responsibilities, and all of that was clear in the classical world. That was 20, 30, 40 years ago. But in this new quantum world, we have to redefine, not destroy them and start a new one. No, that's, I think, one of the great uh, powers of humanity is the ability of having a heritage. I mean, continuation of what you have achieved. So if you have United Nations, we have to strengthen that, that organization. And I'm happy to say that UNCTAD, UNCTAD which is based in, in, in Geneva, have asked me to chair a group of prominent people, presidents, prime ministers of different countries and others, in order to think about the future of that organization. So we have to rethink how to reshape them, how to change what sort of powers or even tools to give them so they will be successful doing what they have to do. Of course, there will be need for some new new ideas as well. As an example, I can share with you. For years, I was thinking about something that I thought it's, it could be a feature of the, this new world. And that uh, I call that the club of smart or successful small states. I mean, how do you how do you define who is smart, who is not, or who is successful or not? It, it's a relative thing. But this is an idea to bring together small states that have shown that this ability of change, ability of understanding, ability looking more to the future. The, change, the success is not about, about the GDP or GDP growth. It's more about the ability. A country like Rwanda that was in a very high, in a very difficult uh, position, have achieved something, and achieved the dramatic things, including bringing, for example, electronic government and new forms of. So I, I consider that it's a successful state. You know, they are in in Middle East, they are in in the Gulf, they are in Europe, they are worldwide, starting from the classical ones that everybody knows. Uh, I don't want to give names here, but the club would be a place where, where the heads of states of these countries will have an exchange of ideas. I've been uh, thinking and putting that together, probably in the near future I'll announce this. I've been discussing that with the heads of small states. This is not an alliance. This is not the European Union, Eurasia Economic Union, or any other alliance, neither military or political. This is just a club where you come and share by sharing also you excite the other side to do if you have done something successful then the other side of your friends because the world is changing it's not necessarily that you have to be huge and mighty massive and very strong with huge territory and and uh, military powers but the small states can have their stay on the global issues on the global development of technology science education we see a lot of fantastic new ideas on how to run the business, how to run education from a small country. So this is absolutely not a alliance uh, putting together uh, countries geographically or economically, not at all. This is just a club, a recognition that small can not be only beautiful, but it could be also important and powerful and successful. So this is an idea, as you said. My suggestion is we keep all of our institutions, organization, let's strengthen them. But in the meantime, do we like it or not, we will be forced to recognize the power of even individuals. Because this is new time. The power of startups. This is 21st century. Startups are becoming more and more important, important part of our economy and industry. So if you go further, 
individuals, startup uh, organizations of these industrial organizations of startups, or they're interconnected. But then you go also to the small states that are supporting startups, they are supporting artificial intelligence, they are future looking states. So a club of them that they can have exchange of that, again, in a friendly club environment, not against, but for everybody. Okay? It's a very strong club of nations collaborating, um, a whole community getting together, also different stakeholders, not only nations, but also companies, large and small startups, but also the individual. Is you're a, a physicist yourself, I think focusing on the human and the interaction with nature is so important. And maybe this crisis now, and as you said, we are at the crossroads right now, is also a chance, an opportunity to rethink our uh, connection uh, and our uh, interaction with nature. So, Mr. President... With many, uh, things, with many things. It's a sort of a cold shower to humanity that the world has changed. It's the time that we start recognizing and rethinking many of our values. Yeah, I think it's a good time to take a, a step back and rethink our, our models. As you said, you have to reinvent, not coming back to the new normal, but uh, to the new kind of um, atomic thinking, forward thinking, and using science uh, to make this happen. Uh, yeah. So, Mr. President, thank you so much for this very powerful message uh, this morning. Uh, all the best uh, to Yerevan, and I should also mention to the audience here that Horasis is planning uh, a big summit uh, in Yerevan in, in October, uh, of course, COVID uh, permitting, uh, and uh, we're very much looking forward to collaborate with Amina and with your good self, Mr. President. Well, thank you very much indeed. Well, my final message, welcome to the, uh, to the quantum world that we have to reshape together. I will be very happy to greet uh, all of your friends and colleagues that are watching in Armenia. But in the meantime, use this. Yes, <laughs> exactly. We are going through tragic times. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Mr. President. Thank you. Bye-bye. All the best to you. Bye-bye.